I have a new computer. This is a Apple PowerBook 150. It's a fairly early Apple notebook from 1994. This is one of Apple's cheapest and nastiest of the PowerBooks. Uh, it's missing many important ports. It's not particularly upgradable, but it does work. And it's a 68,000 laptop machine. And I was wanting one for doing assorted things with. Unfortunately, this one has a few problems and it needs some fairly urgent work. So that is what I'm going to do today. So the most obvious of the problems is the broken hinge and case for the screen. Someone has tried to fix it with some kind of nasty yellow glue, which seems to have failed over time. And it's also shared a number of plastic pieces. But the other problem is internal, and that is the more urgent one. And if you've ever dealt with vintage computers before, you can probably guess what it is. So let's use my power tool and open the case up, and I shall... And I shall show you what it is. So this machine's actually pretty well made. Being an early Apple machine, not one of the late ones, which means it comes apart with fairly normal screws. They are uh, insecurity bits with a star-shaped profile, but luckily the actual uh, the bits to open those are really easy to come by. So there's actually got some plastic clips, so I need my spudger, which of course I've put away and forgotten to get out. Let's try this. Oh no, there is in fact one more screw here. This one is a different size. I'm not sure it is actually. Yeah, it's a different size. Oh yes, I'm just remembering having dealt with this before. Uh, I don't have a bit that will fit this one, so I need to use an ordinary screwdriver. No, I do have a bit that fits, but I still need to use an ordinary screwdriver. So this is all going to be horribly out of focus. Here on the back, you can see the rather limited set of ports. We have power, we have SCSI for an external disk, we have serial, and there is nothing else. Uh, there's no external monitor port, there's no ADB port for an external keyboard, that's all you get. In here there is a space for a modem card, which is not fitted in this. This was received rather poorly when this machine was sold. Even back in 1994 people wanted to plug uh, their computer into a real monitor and keyboard. Okay, I forgot to take the battery out. This is a enormous uh, NICAD battery that is now completely defunct. Uh, the machine doesn't need it to run, luckily. Come on. There we go. Just need to find the clip. This is too flexible. This is the wrong spudger. Let's try this one. Uh, 
And I mentioned I'm not a fan of these plastic clips. There we go. I would so much rather have just ordinary screws in the corners. Okay. Now, you're not going to be able to see what I'm doing next, which is unplugging the top board from the bottom board. So this is the motherboard. We've got the processor, here. We've got the processor, we've got the socket that connects it to the rest of the computer, we've got all the ports in the back here. Here is the slot where the modem fits. Uh, the socket for the modem is about here. There is nothing wrong with this, although at some point I would like to replace the hard drive, which is an IDE drive, with a compact flash one. So I'm going to put this aside. And here, I don't know what's happened to the... Okay, the automatic color balance seems to have gone a bit funny there. But here you can see the problem. And it is called Vata. There is an internal battery which has gone fluffy. And we do not want that on our PCBs. The fluff is highly corrosive and a leaking battery goop can actually eat its way down copper wires and do untold damage to the motherboard. Uh, given that this is actually upside down, if this drips onto the motherboard, that will cause big problems, and I will go and inspect that in a moment. So here we have a RF shield. Oh yeah, that's the high, frequent, uh, high voltage generator for the screen. Uh, fluorescence. So I want to get this board out so I can have a look at it properly and we've got more of the insecurity bolts but luckily they come out easily enough here we've got connectors for uh, well, this is the keyboard, so these will be connecting the keyboard and the trackball. Uh, this is this is the screen connector, and the screen is all, also has problems. I'll show you that once this bit's done. Uh, so I am actually going to have to undo these. So these are thin film clamps, so you just pull the, cl the clamp out to release and the ribbon just lifts out. At least I will do if I can get access. One side. Two sides. This you just push out with difficulty and fingernails. There we go. Okay, it's still fastened down this side. I bet that is this bolt here. There is actually an extra PCB here for the high voltage generator. There we go. You can see the thick, silic thick white silicone wires here that go to the screen. We've got the two sliders for contrast and brightness and here is a plug-on connector that lets us just lift that board out. So. This now goes aside. Hmm. There's a hole there and a seal of some description. That's the middle of the hinge. I wonder what that is. I'll investigate that in a moment. Okay. So we actually have here a fairly dumb distribution board with 
the cable that connects to the PCB, the speaker, and the dreaded VATA battery connect, uh, the dreaded VATA sealed battery. It's a 2.4 volt, 60 milliamp hour rechargeable. Um, we could just cut it off, but it's actually looking in reasonably good condition, so let's try and unsolder it. Okay, the soldering iron is hot. So, uh, let's just wet the end a bit. Come on. And let's try and apply some heat. It shouldn't be I hope this shouldn't be too difficult. There we go. One. Two. Okay, that wasn't so bad. So looking at the battery, uh, there's fluff oozing from this side, the negative side, and there's also some nasty goop here on the positive side. Uh, I shall just put the voltmeter across that. I, I think it's completely dead. They usually are. These Vata batteries are loathsome. This one is nickel metal hydride, and they don't normally... Uh, 200 millivolts. That's supposed to be 2.4 volts, so anyway. Nickel metal hydrides don't normally go as bad as disposables or alkalines, but anyway. So let's have a look, yeah. Okay. Focus is going to be a bit tricky with it on like this, but here you can see some copper exposed. That could be the, uh, the battery goop eating at the tracks. So let's get out the IPA and give it a bit of a swab. Uh, the battery goop is extremely alkaline and one thing you can do is to apply simple vinegar to neutralize it. I don't think I'll have to for this. I think that's okay. Nothing's coming off. Good. Well, I don't intend to run it with a battery. I, it should be just fine without one. So I suppose we now just reassemble it all. So here we have the board. Ah, I know what this hole is for. It's for the loudspeaker. And it goes this way around, and the, the high voltage unit plugs in here. This is actually really rather well put together. It comes apart easily, it goes back together easily. How times have changed. So Drop that into place and let's do some of the screws up. There's a little bit of space in here. And in fact, given that I'm not intending to get a modem card, uh, it would be possible to put in a couple of full size AA nickel metal hydrides like these, possibly AAAs. Uh, and uh, at 1.2 volts each. There are two cells here to get 2.4 volts and the charging circuit in the computer will happily charge double or treble A's. It would be vast overkill but would be cheap and really easy. But I'm not going to do that unless I really have to. This 
The purpose of the bat battery was to preserve the RAM in when you're changing the main battery, presumably so that you can have the computer suspended. Uh, Macs do have a small amount of non-volatile RAM, which might be uh, covered by the same battery. If so, that would be a bit problematic because it contained information like, you know, what drive to boot off and stuff like that. So uh, I can't imagine that that defunct battery was working in any useful fashion. And I've had this thing turned on, so I know it functions. But we'll see. Maybe 200 millivolts was enough to keep the battery alive. Okay, so that plugs in. Just make sure the clamps are released. That drops in there and goes clamps down. That drops in. Is that going all the way down? Let's try that again. We lift the clamp, we drop the ribbon in, we don't have the clamp. Okay, while I have this open, is there anything that's worth cleaning? Well, there's the trackball mechanism, but that's that's actually all right, and that's on the other side of the this board, so you can actually get at it from the outside. Uh, this is the keyboard mechanism. And I believe that at least some of the bits of plastic that it shed are the plastic rivets that hold this down. Um, the keyboard's not in great shape. It's kind of stiff, but I think it's manageable. Okay, I'm not going to fiddle with that anymore. So let's check the other side. Now, the battery was located over here. So I want to look at that bit for signs of corrosion and battery goop. So somewhere around here, I, you are actually getting a rather better look at this than I am, but I think it's okay. I can't see any obvious signs of corrosion. What's this? I have no idea. Yeah, I think that will do. Okay, let's reassemble that. So putting it back together is the simple process of the reverse of taking it apart. Uh, we need to connect this over so there's going to be nothing to see. Balance it like this, and I reach in under here and push the connector home. And drop this into place, and the clips do up. I said the clips do up. There's another clip and the spine, but it doesn't work very well. Okay. And let's just do these up. And then we will go on to the second part of the process, 
which is altogether trickier, but also in some ways simpler, which is a bit of a paradox. And there should be one more of these. And somewhere. Uh, this is the one for the spine, so I will actually do that up. Oh, yeah, sorry, you can't see what I'm doing. Ah, this is actually this white stuff, that's his battery fluff. So there it is. So it's actually a fairly nasty alkali, which I shouldn't get on my fingers. Okay. Right, now let's take a look at the second bit. You notice that I have not opened this yet. There's a reason for this. which is this part of the screen. The plastic has died and the bushes that uh, the screws fasten into have all come adrift from the plastic down this side. So I'm going to have to deal with that somehow. So what I want to do is to dismantle the screen to get access to the hinges. Um, this one, this one, there are two screws that hold the screen in place, well, hold the screen bezel in place, which is this one and the one on the other side. But the one on the other side is no longer holding anything in place because it's broken the uh, the part of the bezel that it actually fastens down to. I'll show you that in more detail once this comes off. Okay, so you can see here uh, there should be a plastic insert that here is missing completely. That is one problem. The other problem is here's the hinges, which when you're not de when you don't have the leverage of the screen working on them are immensely stiff. And you notice if I bend this down, these brass pieces, these brass pieces are supposed to be embedded into the plastic here so that the screw will do up and fasten in place on the, the back of the screen. But they've both pulled out and the bits of plastic that it's been shedding are parts of this bush that holds the, uh, the brass bushing in place, which is kind of not good. So I have two things that need fixing. One is that this hinge needs to be firmly fastened into place onto the the back panel and actually while I'm working on it I'm going to do this screw back up again because currently the only thing that was holding the, this the back of the screen up was this screw and the bush behind it which is that I don't really want that to break so what am I going to do here well Fasten the bushes back again, essentially. So we undo this screw, which releases the bush itself. And the, this bush is supposed to embed into the plastic here. 
so what I'm going to do is to just put this book back in and then glob epoxy around it to hold it in place. And given it's quite small, this is going to be a little bit tricky. Yeah. Uh, now I could undo these two screws that would free the back completely, but this, this ribbon cable is a little bit delicate. Tell you what, I'm going to take the screen off completely. The screen is faulty too. Uh, but that is a subtle electrical problem, and I don't think I can do anything about it. These machines used... Uh, traditional passive liquid crystal screens. The earlier machines had some other technology that was really rather nice. This is one reason why the 150s were not very well thought of. And there is one faulty scan line right across the middle of the screen. Okay. So we've got the screen itself. And this cardboard foil shield. So we're going to just put that down. This is fastened in under here. It's RF protection. I should be able to get this off once these are undone, I hope. I need to uh, release the screen, which means bending this hinge to the upright position. Free the back of the hinge and there we go and it just lifts free so here we've got the cardboard shield here we have the screen the, the back proper and here we have all the electronics so I need to remove the other bush So, the first bush has in fact got lost under here, and then we put all the electronics aside. And now we're left with the plastic. This is a good thing because uh, now this thing is vertically up and down which means we don't have to worry about uh, epoxy dribbling. Now, this is interesting. There is, seems to be a washer around this bolt, a rather bent washer. And I wonder if this is part of the original attempt to fix the thing. You can see the nasty yellow glue here, which I'm going to have to scrape off. So, here you can see the two bushes embedded in plastic. So essentially all we have to do is to put these back here in the upright position and make sure they stay in place. That's not upright. 
Anyway, I'm going to do the bolts up so that the inside of the bush is filled. So that we don't need to worry about uh, epoxy getting into the screw thread, which would be rather bad. Uh, come on. Oh, that is the wrong screw. I want this one. <laughs> that was just a random screw lying on my workbench. So this one will go here. And this one will go here. I'm not convinced about the verticalness of this. I think it will do. All right. So the next step is to mix up the epoxy and apply it. OK, so we have the ubiquitous bottle top. We have my tube of epoxy that is increasingly old and difficult to get open. Uh, Great, I knew that would happen one day. I have a feeling that this tube of epoxy is reaching the end of its use by. Uh, there is a date code on the top of 2019, but I'm sure I've had this for longer. Okay, there we go. We need a reasonable amount of it because in order to get the mix right, Uh, now I need to get the top back on. Somehow. So epoxy, if you didn't know, is a very strong two-part glue where you have the gel and the catalyst and by themselves they don't really set. Mix them together and they start reacting and you end up with something that sets very quickly and incredibly robustly. So I am now on the clock uh, the gel does dry out with time. Yeah, I'm going to deal with that after I've done this bit. So I think what's happening is the gel has dried. And, you know, the catalyst that gets its way into the cap has mixed with a little bit of the gel and started producing... And it is just solidified. Okay. So possibly I might need to chip some of this off after it's set. Whoops. Okay, this is fundamentally kind of messy process, sadly. Also, I am doing this wrong, so I need to make sure there is some under it as well. Another thing to note about epoxy is it is in fact poisonous. Apparently, oh, blast. 
some people under ridiculous emergency situations like Arctic explorers who've had uh, decayed teeth have ended up having to fill their own teeth with epoxy and it's you really don't want to do that. I mean, the whole idea of having to do your own fillings is kind of terrible, but you really don't want to do it with epoxy. Okay. That was a ridiculous waste of glue, but that's all we need, just that little glob. So next, I'm going to try and get this top back on. All right, day two, I have let the epoxy cure, at least for a bit. It should get a little bit more solid as time passes, but this will do for now. I actually did a bit of work uh, off camera. Pump uh, one part was that I completely forgotten to do anything about this piece, so I have attached this uh, metal ring here, which the uh, is going to hold the screw in. Uh, the other was that the bush here wasn't quite straight, and I had to do it again. I'm actually wondering slightly whether epoxy is the right kind of glue for this. Uh, it good and hard and pretty strong but it's also quite brittle and there's going to be quite a lot of sideways torque in these bushes so it may all just fall apart on me. Oh yeah and one bit I forgot which was that this bush here had also fallen out so that's being now glued back in place again. So the next thing to do is to deal with some of this nasty yellow glue from the previous attempt to fix it. There is some on both sides. So let us liberally apply some IPA with a uh, cotton bud to soften it and then attempt to scrape it off with a knife. I don't know if the IPA will actually help, but we can always give it a try. It's kind of rubbery, I don't know what it is but it was clearly not strong enough. So, let's put some on there. And we have my trusty Ikea knife, not a kitchen knife. Okay, I think that will do. It's not perfect, but uh, none of this is structural, so I suppose the next thing to do is to try putting it back together again and see if my glue joints hold up, which is going to be moderately exciting to try. Let me just move some of the tools out of the way. and clean up some of the debris. So the first piece that we have to deal with is the back, because that's the piece the screen connects to. So this will, oh yeah, I didn't, Mustn't forget the shield, which will screw down here. Now you see this bit's actually torn off. 
Oh, there's a couple of spikes that I hadn't noticed. These are either missing or broken off on this side. Anyway. So the... Uh, the uh, this fastens to the hinge using the inner set of screws, which I believe are the silver ones. So let's do these up and see what happens. One thing I've been worrying slightly about is uh, the epoxy actually sticks up here, so I will need to be sure that there's enough clearance. So, silver bolt, the inside. So this one is a real bush. That's why I'm doing it up first. Like so. Now the other one, where did that screw go? should be more tidy on my workbench. Because this is actually, there's a couple of different sizes. Uh, I believe it's this one. And this is the bit where the lid this is the bit where the lid has to stick vertically upwards. Okay, come on, go into the bush. Damn it. Yeah, the epoxy broke. Very suddenly. It's just not strong enough. That's a shame. I'm going to have to think of something else. One thing I could try is gluing it down on again, and this time leaving it a couple of days to cure a bit more. But I honestly... don't think that will make much of a difference. Yeah, you can see it's just snapped straight out. And actually, I can probably take a guess as to why, which is that everything was fine until the screw reached the bottom of the bush at which point it just came out the bottom and popped the whole thing off. But no, looking at the bottom of the bush, there is actually a ring of epoxy in the bottom of it, so... No, I reckon that was just too much sideways talk. Yeah. Right, so I... I'm going to have to rethink my plans here. How am I going to fasten this in and have it actually strong enough to support the lid? Okay, let's try something a little crazy and desperate. So we're going to mix up quite a lot of epoxy. I reckon that this tube will last a few more days without the top on, so we might as well use it. I have done the two screws up here. This side is pushed into place. I've chipped off all the epoxy, which actually uh, there was a bulge of epoxy that was stopping the hinge from making proper contact, so that would never have worked anyway. Three, 
he makes the stuff up. I put the screws in on the right hand side with the bushes attached. And let's see if this works. It will briefly, it is sucking up into the dropper. And we're just going to attempt to squirt it in there. It hasn't really worked. The epoxy will slowly thicken as it begins to set. So this has to be done really quickly. So what I'm attempting to do is to glue the entire hinge, including the bushes, into place. Come on, it's still sucking it up into the pipette. Okay, let's try that. Oh, it's coming into the pipette, but it's not coming out again. That's better. So I'm actually going to attempt to stick the entire hinge into place. That should give... Okay, I think that's about as limit as what we can do with this thing. It's a bit of a shame. I was hoping for more. All right, let's just use this then. Because that should provide... No, that's not going to work. We need something smaller. Trying to get as much epoxy in into the hinge mechanism as possible to stick the entire hinge to the back panel. That will hopefully provide enough force to make the blasted thing stay in place. Ah, the epoxy in my hands, this stuff stinks. Because if I can get the force transferred evenly by the entire hinge across the the to the plastic, then that's less force on the bushes and generally better. If it doesn't work, it then I can chip the epoxy off the metal reasonably easily. And then we're going to leave it 24 hours, or possibly even 48, and try it again and see how it, whether it's actually worked or not. Right, it is now too thick. Okay. And that's that. All right then, let's see if this worked. So, quick recap, what I have done, tips back so that you can see, is I have attempted to glue this entire hinge mechanism to the back of the case, rather than just the bushes. This should give a much stronger uh, bond to the case. Hopefully, crossing fingers, strong enough. So let us... Try 
it and see what happens. That seems plausible. That seems to be working. Good, well, there is one thing I need to do, which is to remove the outer screws from both sides. I'll start with this one. This will actually probably be bonded in place by the glue, so it might be... Oh no, that's not bad. So having glued this on, I then won't be able to get it off again without breaking the seal. But I don't actually need to take the back of the screen off. So hopefully that will do just fine. Okay, um, I need, the next tricky bit is to put the back, this panel back on again. Uh, this actually screws on underneath the hinge on this side. So let me just think how to do this. Uh, It's, a, it's supposed to be grounded. It's an RF shield. I think, to be honest, I'm not going to put that on. It's not really necessary, and uh, fiddling with this too much will just cause tears. So let's just put the screen on, for which we need... Four silver screws. That's not one. Uh, let me see where I've put the screws. There they are. Okay. So. The. This wire for the. Uh. the fluorescent lights that light up the screen doesn't want to get caught under that boss. Let's try to hook it in under there. And there's actually a couple of plastic studs which it hangs on like so. The screen is also faulty. I mentioned it's got this missing scan line down the middle. But I don't really think there's anything I can do about that, to be honest. Okay. There is a strong smell of epoxy, which it will fade with time as the plastic cures. It bonds pretty rapidly, like a few minutes, but then it spends several days gradually getting stronger. It's now uh, f about 48 hours since I did that hinge. And then that tucks in there. Mm, have I screwed that up? Uh, is that supposed to fit in underneath this? Well, first thing I'm going to do is actually turn it on and see if it works. Because if I've managed to pinch or otherwise damage the uh, ribbon cable to the screen, that will need dealing with now. So, ah, let's try and turn this switch on. And it lights up. And it boots. 
Okay, the screen works and it's got that strip down the side. And let's just do a bit of massaging of the screen to see if anything happens. No. No. Okay, well, let's put the front case on. Some plastic clips. And then the black screws do up. careful with this one because that's the one that's bonded in the plastic so let's not do this up too tightly just power down okay uh, and let's just try closing the lid and see if it actually latches Looks okay, I think that's plausible. And uh, still a bit of, there's still some marks from glue goop there, but it's okay. That side's okay as well. So that's just dirt. That seems quite promising to be honest. I should probably put this away and then not fiddle with it for another couple of days just to let the glue cure. Uh, but let us open up the trackball and give this a bit of a clean. So let's see, you can see you've got uh, the these rollers here. Uh, are the the optical encoders as these rotate when the ball turns it it rolls the rollers there is one for X which is this one and one for Y which is this one here we have little metal roller bearings that support the ball in the other two directions so what we're gonna do is just clean off the rollers with IPA because they tend to uh, fill up with other people's sweat, which is a bit disgusting. Trying to make it stop rotating. You're supposed to clean mouse balls as well, which led to all the inevitable jokes that you can imagine. Some of them good, most of them not. Yeah, there's a certain amount of filth in that. I should probably take off and clean the keys as well, but they actually appear to be in pretty good nick. Yuck. And let's just do the other end. Because what everyone really likes are alcoholic mouse balls. Okay. interesting thing about Max is that Mac mice only have one button and you notice this trackball in fact has a two buttons well you might you might have noticed that but you would in fact be wrong these are both the same button it's to allow you to use any combination of hands or fingers you might wish bit of a waste really Okay, well, one final thing, which is to put the one remaining rubber bung over 
one of these screws, there's supposed to be two, like so. And I think that is done. Just have a quick look around. Oh yes, there is a little plastic cap that goes over this. It's, it's quite useless. And I think that's done. The one thing remaining is the battery, which is completely defunct. It doesn't charge. And I can't remember whether I said so last time. It's been several days. It would be rather nice as this is just a perfectly ordinary NICAD battery pack to take the lid off, remove the old battery cells and replace them with AA uh, a double A holder. So that way you can replace the batteries with perfectly normal double uh, A NICADs. Uh, it will still charge in the computer using the, ch the computer's built in charging circuitry. And uh, if the battery, yeah, NICAD, if the battery module starts to fail again, then you can just swap out the double A's easily. Unfortunately, these things are usually glued or heat welded together and opening them up is a complete pain in the ass. Uh, you're not going to spudge this open. So I'm going to do a bit of research about that to see whether it's possible or not and come back to it. But yes, the machine works. I'm not going to demonstrate it now because I want to wait a few days for the glue to harden. Oh yeah, here's a, here is some glue. Still a little bit sticky, but mostly hard. Uh, and then I'm going to install an English version of MacOS on it, because this is currently running the German version, which is just the same. It's just my German's not good enough to actually understand it. So a probably rather disjointed, depending on how well I managed to edit this together, video on doing some basic maintenance of a old 68k Apple alleged notebook computer. I hope you enjoyed this video. Do let me know what you think in the comments.